Right, so this afternoon, actually today and tomorrow, we'll be looking at reproductive system, anatomy and physiology. So we will start with the male reproductive system. Then we will look at female reproductive system. And uh, part three will be development and congenital anomalies of the reproductive systems. So we will do what we'll be able to do today. And uh, the remaining part will finish tomorrow. Uh, So let's begin with this part of male reproductive system. These are the things that we need to address in this particular part of the lecture. We are going to look at the outline of the components of the male reproductive system. And we're also going to study the functions of the male reproductive system. We will then describe the anatomy and role of the male external genitalia. We will also describe the structure and role of the testis, which is the male gonad. We will, at that point, talk about the hormonal axis that control male sexual function, and that is the hypothalamus, hypophysial testicular hormonal axis. After that, we will look at the different components of the male genital duct system, or what we loosely call the male reproductive tract. We will also look at the structure and role of the male sex glands. Those are the things that produce semen. And lastly, we will explain the physiology of male sexual response. So straight away, we can start with the first objective where we want to know the functions and the components of the male reproductive system, at least in overview. So starting the functions, if someone asks you to state the key functions of the male reproductive system, you don't start with saying sex, you know, uh, we talk of the production, maintenance, and transport of viable sperms for fertilization. And that's basically the reproductive function of the male reproductive system. We also talk about passage of urine, and that's likely because the urethra passes through the penis. And uh, we talk of production of male sex hormones, which we call androgens. These are the key functions of the male reproductive system. In terms of outlining the components, we do outline the components of the male reproductive system as having an external genitalia and internal genitalia. When you talk of the external genitalia, we're referring to the penis and the scrotum. And when you talk of the internal genitalia, we're referring to three entity of structures, the gonad, the genital ducts and the sex glands. So those three entity of structures constitute the male internal genitalia, the gonad, the genital ductal system, as well as the sex glands. And we'll be looking at them one by one. So let's start by looking at the structure and role of the male external genitalia. Having mentioned that the male external genitalia consists of the scrotum and the penis, let's start by talking about the anatomy and function of the scrotum. In terms of anatomy, the scrotum is just a thin skin, usually that houses the testes. So basically just skin. It is one big skin with a septum in the middle or nearly the middle, dividing the scrotal sacs into two compartments, the right scrotal sac compartment and the left scrotal sac compartment. And those scrotal sac compartment are the ones that contain the respective testes. The scrotum is designed in such a way that can both protect 
the testes as well as lower its temperature. You know that the temperature of the test is about two to three degrees below the normal body temperature. That is the optimal temperature for uh, spermatogenesis. So because of this fact that the scrotum need to lower the temperature of the testes, there's some unique anatomical features that are displayed by the scrotum. One of them being very thin skin. Two is lacking fat beneath. And three, this ability for it to just uh, shrink like this and relax when it's hot is because it has some muscle on it, which are called datos muscle. The datos muscle contract when it's cold, like the one we are seeing here is contracted, and so the skin is wrinkled. And then when it is hot, the datos muscle relaxes so that uh, the skin of the scrotum stretch, stretch out to promote heat loss. Well, uh, the men will also tell you that there's a lot of sweat, there are a lot of sweat glands in this region to just facilitate the process of heat loss. Apart from the scrotum, we have the penis. The penis is the basically the male organ of copulation. In terms of its structure, the penis has three parts. We have the root, the shaft, and the gland of the penis. The shaft is also what you call the body of the penis. Let's talk about the structure of the penis starting with the root of the penis. The root of the penis refers to the part of the penis that hold the penis to the perineum. This root has two key components. This is what we call the cruise of the penis. In plural, crura. We have a right and a left cruise. The cruise of the penis is attached to the ischium or the ischiotuberosity. And this cruise goes to the corpus cavernosum of the shaft of the penis. There's a muscle that covers the cruise because that muscle is coming from the ischiotuberosity as well to go to the corpus cavernosum, we call that muscle ischiocavenosus muscle. So the muscle ischiocavenosus lines or covers the cruise of the penis. Remember the crura is paired, so we have right and left cruise of the penis, holding it to the ischiotuberosity. But there's also another structure, which we call the bulb of the penis. The bulb of the penis, hold the penis to the perineal body. This perineal body is also known as the central tendon of the perineum. So the bulb of the penis hold the penis to the perineal body. The bulb attaches from the perineal body to the corpus spongiosum of the shaft. For that reason, the muscle that lines the bulb of the penis is known as bulbospongiosus. So the whole of this is the bulb of the penis and that muscle is bulbospongiosus. That is penile root. Hold the penis to the perineum. Then we talk about the shaft of the penis. <clears throat> the penile shaft is primarily for mediating the erectile physiology. For that reason, it contains erectile tissues, tissues which are able to expand and become firm and at some point be very flaccid and you wonder what's this. Basically, those are the erectile tissues. There, we have two types of erectile tissues. We have what we call the corpus cavernosum. The corpus cavernosum are two. We have right and left corpus cavernosum. So the plural for corpus is corpora. Then there's one ventral one, which we call corpus spongiosum. There are two types of erectile tissues, but as we can see, there are three erectile tissues. It's like three cylinders within one big cylinder. The one big cylinder is a thick connective tissue covering that encases the three cylinders that thick connective tissue covering that encases the three cylinders is what we are calling the tunica 
albuginia. There are some veins <clears throat> which are just beneath the tunic albuginia. We call them subtunical veins. I'll be talking about them as we talk about the penile erectile response uh, towards the tail end of the lecture. Now, the shaft of the penis is continuous with the root of the penis in this manner. The bulb of the penis is continuous with the corpus spongiosum. You can say corpus spongiosum radiates from the bulb of the penis, while corpus cavernosa radiates from the crus of the penis. Notably, the corpus spongiosum contains the urethra, the penile urethra or the spongy urethra, if you wish, is contained within corpus spongiosum. That's the penile shaft. Then we talk of the penile glands or the glands penis. The glands penis is that anterior swelling of the corpus spongiosum. At the tip of it is the opening of the urethra. That means that urine passes through there. The glands penis is highly innervated and also sensitive and especially during coitus. And so it is largely for sexual stimulation. During intercourse or even before intercourse and also for penetration during intercourse. Right, so that is structure of the male external genitalia. We've talked about the anatomy of the penis. We've talked about anatomy of the scrotum and we've stated the functions of each. Told you that male reproductive system consists of external genitalia and internal genitalia. And for internal genitalia, I told you that we can divide the components into three. The male gonad, which is known as the testis the male genital duct system, which is the part followed by semen from the testes to the exterior. And uh, the male sex glands, which are the structures responsible for producing semen. So these are the three categories of components of the male internal genitalia. I want us to talk about one entity of the male internal genitalia, and that is the male gonad the testis. In its structure, we mentioned that the testis is within the scrotum. Just like the penis, the testis is also covered by a thick capsule known as the tunica albuginia. This tunica albuginia looks like this. It sends in several septa that cut across the testicular parenchyma. Those septa are known as testicular septa. The testicular septa divided the testicular parenchyma into several lobules. We have about 250 to 300 lobules in each testis. The testicular lobules are the ones that contain the functional component of the testes. These are the seminiferous tubules of the testes, as well as the interstitial tissue of the testes. Those are the functional components of the testes. So histologically, this is how the testes would look like. These are the seminiferous tubules cut in cross section. So this is just one big one. Yet another one and another one there. But then between them, these are the interstitial tissue. So let's talk about the seminiferous tubule first. The seminiferous tubules of the testes are made up of complex stratified epithelium. I hope you do remember the parameters we check 
when you want to classify epithelium, we said you look at the number of cell layers and because this one is more than one, we call it complex. The other options would be simple and pseudo stratified. Now, okay, I think I've confused you. So now that this one is several layers, we call it stratified. The other options would be simple if it was one layer or pseudo stratified if it is one layer that appears like it is multiple layers. So this one is stratified epithelium. Then the second thing we look at when you want to classify epithelium is the shape of the cells on top. And in this one, we can't really pinpoint a particular shape. So it's complex. And that's why we are calling it complex stratified epithelium. But in principle, there are three shapes of epithelial cells that can be possible, not necessarily in these ones. It could be square mass, could be columnar, could be cuboidal. Now, those don't apply here. Here we go with complex stratified epithelium. This complex stratified epithelium forms the site of spermatogenesis. And so that brings us to one key role of the testes, the site of spermatogenesis, production of sperms. The seminiferous epithelium itself has a number of cell types. There are varieties of cells which are in the seminiferous epithelium. One of those varieties is basically the cells of the spermatogenic series. The cells of the spermatogenic series refer to the cells which are in the lineage of the formation of sperms. So we do know that these ones include things like spermatogonia, which undergo mitosis to become primary spermatocytes, which undergo first meiotic division to become secondary spermatocytes, which undergo the second meiotic division to become spermatids. The spermatids undergo spermiogenesis to become spermatozoa. So we have five cell types which belong to these cells of spermatogenic series in the order in which I've given to you. Apart from cells of spermatogenic series, within this wall, we also have the myoid cells. Myoid cells are contractile cells. They're the cells that contract to promote the release of sperms from the wall to the lumen of seminiferous tubules. And lastly, we have the Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells are the supporting cells of spermatogenesis. They have a number of functions. They provide structural support to the developing sperms, which means that they basically hold the sperms. They also establish the blood testicular barrier. And this ensures that the various components of blood, some of them not very good for development of sperms, are prevented from reaching the sperms. There's a barrier between blood and the sperms, and that's what we call the blood testicular barrier. This is particularly important because remember, uh, sperm cells are not like any other cell in the body. Sperm cells represent future generation. So if there's a mutation on a sperm, it might mean a whole lineage of people having that mutation. So you need to closely protect the genetic makeup of the sperms so that we don't have these mutations taking place. And that's why we need to protect the sperms from blood. Sertoli cells usually engulf excess cytoplasmic material from sperms during the process of spermiogenesis. Remember, the process of spermiogenesis is the process of cytodifferentiation when a lot of changes in the cytoplasm occur so that the spermatids become spermatozoa. Sertoli cells also produce some factors. One of those factors is known as the myelin inhibiting factor. You can call it myelin inhibiting hormone or anti myelin hormone. The anti myelin hormone is important during 
the embryonic development of a male child. Usually there's what we call Mullerian duct, which is the primordium of the female reproductive system. This Mullerian duct is present whether the embryo will be male or will be female. But if the embryo is male, then you don't need the Mullerian duct because it forms female tract. So what do we do? There must be some molecular signal that leads to the suppression of the Mullerian duct. And that is the Mullerian inhibiting factor, which come from the Sertoli cells of the testes. By the time a baby has a testis, it means that uh, this baby has committed to be forming male. And in that case, then we don't need the Mullerian duct. Apart from anti-Mullerian hormone, Sertoli cells also produce androgen binding proteins. These are chemical proteins in nature, of course, that bind androgens in the testes, hence, ensuring high concentration of androgens in the testes. Remember, you need androgens in the testes so that they can help in the process of spermatogenesis. Okay, having said that, let's revisit the story of spermatogenesis. So we agreed that the site of spermatogenesis, the seminiferous tubules of the testes, we also agree that the process of spermatogenesis begins sometimes in puberty, not before puberty. But it takes about two months to form a single sperm. The process of spermatogenesis usually does not end until that man dies. So it continues throughout life. And that the optimal temperature for spermatogenesis is about two to three degrees below the body temperature, the cells that support development of sperms are called Sertoli cells. Remember, we are still talking about the testes and we've looked at one entity of the testicular parenchyma that was the seminiferous tubules of the testes. The second entity of the testicular parenchyma is what we call the interstitial tissue. In this histological image, this is seminiferous tubules of the testes, but this is interstitial tissue. The interstitial tissue of the testes consists of loose connective tissue, but this loose connective tissue is heavily or richly vascularized, contains a lot of capillaries. There are some cells within this loose connective tissue, which we call the interstitial cells of Leydig. These interstitial cells of Leydig are responsible for secreting the male sex hormones, which we call androgens. The key male sex hormones that come from the interstitial tissue are testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Right, so that is structure of the testes. Now that we've talked about androgens, let's talk about the hypothalamo hypophysial testicular hormonal axis. I believe by now you're familiar with this hormonal axis. If I give it to you, it's one of those questions. You first stop and thank God, then you proceed to answer. The hypothalamus produces a hormone that act on the anterior pituitary gland. Well, hypothalamus produces several hormones that act on the anterior pituitary gland. But if you want to form, describe the path of hypothalamo hypophysial testicular axis, then the hormone you're putting there is GnRH, which stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. As the name suggests, that hormone promote the release of gonadotropins. And what are we calling gonadotropins? The, the gonadotropic hormones are those hormones which are tropic to the gonad. In this case, the gonad is a testis. So which hormones are tropic to the gonad? The hormones which are tropic to the gonads are the follicle stimulating hormone as well as the luteinizing hormone. 
So follicle stimulating hormone primarily targets the Sertoli cells of the testes and its physiological effect is to promote the process of spermatogenesis. On the other hand, luteinizing hormone targets the interstitial cells of Leydig and uh, the aim is to promote secretion of androgens. This is the hormonal axis of male. So let's say something about the androgens. Remember, when we are discussing the endocrine system, we intentionally left out the sex hormones because there's a better time to talk about them and this is that better time. Androgens are steroid hormones. Told you that a steroid hormone is a hormone that is made up from cholesterol. So it's a lipid based hormone. Such hormones tend to have their receptors within the cell, intracellular receptors, as opposed to on the cell membrane, like those of protein hormones. So in particular, androgen hormones, which are steroids, have two primary sources. Androgens can be produced by the interstitial cells of Leydig, and this is the main site of production but androgens can also come from the zona reticularis of the adrenal cortex. So we call those ones adrenohandrogens to distinguish them from testicular androgens. Testicular androgens are the ones I told you earlier, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. These are the adrenal androgens. We have androstindione. Then this one stands for AP androstindione. And this one stands for dihydroepiandrostindione. So remember this is androstindione. This A stands for androstindione. So you just put epiandrostindione. Then the, this DH stands for dihydro. So dihydroepiandrostindione. You may not remember those last three androgens and it's understandable. Make sure you remember that the main androgens are testosterone and dihydrotestosterone because those are the ones that are largely coming from the testes and the test is the primary site of androgen secretion. So what is important for us is to know, so what is the key role of androgen? And there are a number of functions of androgens. During development of the male child in the mother's womb, androgens are important in causing what we call virilization of the indifferent genitalia. The indifferent genitalia refers to the embryonic primordium of the genital system the embryonic primordium of the genital organs. Whether these organs will be male or female, it doesn't matter at this point. <clears throat> There's a time of development when you have embryonic structures representing development of the reproductive organ. These embryonic structures are not yet differentiated. So you can't tell whether it will form male structures or female structures. That's what we call the indifferent genitalia. So androgens act on the indifferent genitalia to cause what we call virilization. Virilization is the process of male patterning. It can be so serious that even if an embryo is XY, but does not have adequate androgens, that the genitalia of that baby will be female. The other functions of androgens that help in spermatogenesis, they also promote male libido. So please don't be <clears throat> demonizing uh, the men you stay with because of this. Now you know that it's testosterone that drive our attention, uh, drive, give us the energy for what we do. Testosterone 
raises libido. Uh, testosterone also promotes bone and muscle mass. And perhaps that's why the men will then be called masculine based on the outline of their physique. Last but not least, androgens are important in promoting development of the male secondary sexual characteristics. When you talk of such, we are referring to things like broadening of the chest, breaking of the voice, baldness, um, growth of hair in, okay, the term has disappeared, but you know what I mean. So these are functions of androgens. Now I want to talk about the components and role of the male genital duct system. Remember, we are still talking about male internal genitalia. So the male genital duct system refers to the path that is followed by sperms all the way from the testes to the exterior. Doesn't matter where the exterior is, but as long as it's come out from the male reproductive system. So let's follow this ductal system. <clears throat> let's start here and try to follow the trajectory of sperms. So these are the seminiferous tubules of the testes, and that is indeed where the sperms are formed. From the seminiferous tubules of the testes, the sperms go to these segments where the tubule straighten out, and rightfully so, we call that the straight tubule. There are several straight tubules. Multiple straight tubules meet and anastomose form a network. This communication of numerous straight tubules is known as the rete testis. So from the straight tubules, sperms go to the rete testis. From the rete testis, there are these channels which take sperms to the epididymis, and we call them the efferent ductules. So we started from seminiferous tubules, then went to the straight tubule, then to the rete testis, and now to the efferent ductules. From the efferent ductules, sperms go to the epididymis. So this is the epididymis. Actually, the efferent ductules form the head of the epididymis. Then from the head of the epididymis, there's one long duct that is highly convoluted. We call it the duct of the epididymis. But to keep it simple, the whole of that is the epididymis. From the epididymis, we have the vast difference. So this is the epididymis, and this is the vast difference. Remember what we mentioned some time back when we were talking about spermatogenesis in terms of the role of the epididymis and the vas. We said that the epididymis and the vas are a site of storage of sperms and that sperms can be stored for about two to three months within the male reproductive system and they remain viable. Apart from storage of sperms, we mentioned that the epididymis and the vas are also a site of decapacitation of sperms. Decapacitation of sperms is the removal of the sperm sorry, is the application of the sperm glycoprotein material over its head and that makes the sperm less motile and perhaps blinding the sperm so that they don't start looking for the oocyte where it cannot be found. It is important that you remember that the sperms are viable for about two to three months within the male reproductive system. Because see, if a man goes for vasectomy, usually that procedure will cut the vas at this point. So if a man goes for vasectomy today, and you tell this man that now, 
from tomorrow you are a free gear. You know, this guy can sue you if they have a baby. Because this is what happened. The sperms are stored in the epididymis as well as the vas. So if you cut here, there's some sperms which are still here, which are still viable. If this man is going to ejaculate, the ejaculate may have those sperms. That means that this person is still fertile. So we usually tell them after vas vasectomy, they need to stay for at least three months using other means of contraception if need be. Then after that, we are sure that uh, we are safe in terms of contraception. Because after those three months, we know that now the sperms are no longer viable, the ones which were in the vast difference. From the vast difference, sperms go to the ejaculatory ducts. The ejaculatory ducts are formed by union of the duct of seminal vesicles with the vast difference. That's what you call the ejaculatory duct. The ejaculatory duct in particular pass through the prostate gland. The right and left ejaculatory duct then open into the urethra. This is the urethra. From our lectures on reprodu not reproductive renal system, I think we talked about the different parts of the male urethra as having the prostatic urethra, membranous urethra, and the penal urethra, which you can divide into bulbar urethra and spongy urethra. There's something called the spermatic cord. The spermatic cord is a sheet that contains the vast difference and the blood vessels which go to the testes. We call them testicular vessels. This particular sheet usually extend from the abdominal cavity toward the scrotum. And for it to do that, it means it passes through some channel and the channel passes through the inguinal canal. At some point we talked about the anatomy of the inguinal canal. So I think uh, this is not very new to you. Just to trigger your mind a bit about a common pathology that we usually see uh, in the surgical unit, and that is testicular torsion. Testicular torsion is twisting of the testes. And usually the test is usually twist around the spermatic cord. My question to you is this, when there is testicular torsion, what are you really worried about in this particular boy child? Anyone? What's your biggest worry in testicular torsion? Fertility. Yes, fertility. Yes, what's the link between testicular torsion and fertility? Uh, I think the, the movement of the sperms mm -hmm. will be compromised by the torsion. Okay, I agree with you that we are worried about fertility, but the mechanism that you are describing, that one we are not worried about. The spermatic cord is such a thick thing and very tough, even if you have testicular torsion, it's unlikely to be affected. And if anything, remember, testicular torsion largely occurs in boys. Uh, they have not even started having sex, perhaps. So any other person, what's our biggest worry in a boy with developed testicular torsion? Why is it such an emergency? Yes, and Kristen? Uh, just trying. Yes. You don't say uh, the, the, okay, the cut, the cut down of uh, blood supply. Yes, that's actually it. When you have testicular torsion, you compromise blood flow to the penis, so, sorry, to the testes. And if you compromise blood flow to the testes, it means that the testes may die. 
And usually the grace period is about six hours. If you cut blood flow to the uh, testes for about six hours, the testes actually dies. That's your biggest worry. That the testes may undergo necrosis. Of course, if it undergoes necrosis, then it means there'll be no spermatogenesis from that end. I think I've already mentioned about the urethra having three parts. I've also mentioned that uh, the penile urethra consists of this part, which we call the bulbar urethra, and that part which we call the spongy urethra. You notice that the penile urethra is within the corpus spongiosum, as well as the bulb of the penis. I think when we are looking at the renal system, I told you that the prostatic urethra is the widest part of the male urethra although it is the part that is most commonly obstructed because of prostatic enlargement. The membranous urethra is the shortest and narrowest part of the male urethra and is the part that usually offer resistance during male catheterization. And I've told you that the penile urethra is the longest part, having those two parts. Within the glans penis, there's a small swelling, dilatation of the penile urethra, which we call the navicular fossa. We talked about differences between the male and female urethra. And uh, I think this is still familiar in your head that the male urethra is longer, it is narrower, it is more angulated it opens externally and it has two key functions, reproductive as well as urinary functions. Okay, now let's talk about the male sex glands. So basically the male sex glands refer to the organs or the glands that produce semen. Usually, this contributes to the overall volume of semen. So we have a number of glands. The bulbourethral glands are also called the corpus glands. Corpus glands are tiny glands. I've actually never seen one, very tiny. And they open at the junction between the membranous urethra and the bulbar urethra. We call them bulbar urethral glands or basically corpus glands. They produce a lubricant during sexual intercourse. So something that's lubricate the urethra. Then we have the prostate gland. The prostate gland is located below the bladder. That's what we call the bladder neck. Prostate gland is only one, just inferior to the urinary bladder. And uh, the urethra passes through the prostate gland. That's how I was telling you that if the prostate enlarges, then it can constrict the urethra and cause urinary tract obstruction. The prostate histologically has a number of zones. Those zones have different predisposition to some pathology. There are four histological zones. There's what we call the transition zone. The transition zone is largely that part that is housing the urethra. And that's the part that is most prone to benign enlargement. Then we have the central zone that's the part that is containing the ejaculatory duct. Lastly, we have what you call the peripheral zone. The peripheral zone at the large sides of the prostate, which are in the periphery, containing most of the glands. This is the commonest site of origin of prostate cancers. 
So the cancers largely originate from the peripheral zone. Benign enlargement uh, commonly originate from the transition zone. There's another histological zone that does not contain glands. We call it the anterior fibromuscular zone of the prostate. It lacks glands, but it's part of the prostate. Okay, then we have the seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles are paired. So we have right and left seminal vesicles. They are located behind the urinary bladder, between the bladder and the rectum. Seminal vesicles produce fructose that nourish the sperms with energy. The prostate produces alkaline fluid that help to neutralize the acidity of the vagina. Then lastly, we have the paraurethral glands, also called the glands of litter. These glands are on the wall of the urethra or they open into the penile urethra. You can't count them, there are several tiny glands. They open into the penile urethra, also contributing to semen volume. Um, not much of semen volume though, but largely lubricating the urethra during coitus, just like the bulboyurethral glands of corpus. Great, so having said so, we can now talk about the physiology of male sexual response before I give you a break. So here we are going to look at really what happens during male sexual response. <clears throat> a normal sexual function of men will require interaction of some three parameters, sorry, four parameters, the blood vessels, the nervous system, the endocrine system, and basically the mentation, the mind of the person. The obligatory event of sexual response, which is erection, in as much as it is vascular phenomenon, that it's the blood vessels which are behaving so that there's an erection, that vascular phenomenon is triggered by the nervous system. So there must be a nervous system stimulating this vascular phenomenon. But that nervous signal can only be successful in the context of appropriate hormonal balance and an appropriate psychological mindset. For example, if I'm walking in town and I, I, I see a glance at you and I see that you're beautiful and I feel like, oh, if I could only taste, you know, it will only end there. I might erect, but that erection not last for long. It will just end because the environment will not allow my mindset to just continue concentrating that idea to fulfillment. If let's say, we are having sex in a context where maybe we are stealing and then someone knocks the door, you know, that can just kill everything because of the psychological mindset. Or if some two people are having sex and uh, the door is open, uh, you are fearing that somebody can come in anytime, you know, you will not be fully settled. If there's some hormonal imbalance, again, it may not help it to be more effective. Perhaps it explains why the older men become then the harder the, the, the steam, or rather, let me put it this way. They become weaker as they grow older. The energy that uh, a 70 or an 80 year old man will have in sex is different from the energy a 25 year old will have in sex. Because of the hormonal decline with age. So I hope you understand that many parameters must work in sync so that we can have a successful male sexual response. We can describe male sexual response in five phases. 
there's the first phase, which we call sexual stimulation. A man has to be stimulated, but how are men stimulated? Men can be stimulated by sensations. The type of sensations that stimulate men are largely what a man sees. If they look at you and they see your curvature, whether you are dressed or naked, but that curvature can stimulate. Or they look at your ass and they see it's beautiful. They can, that can stimulate them. They see your breast and that can attract them. They see your face and that can attract men. Apart from that also tactile stimulation, this is touch. If a man touches you or being touched, can, that can stimulate. But usually more about the man touching a female rather than a female touching a male. So the tactile stimulation is about the man touching a woman, irrespective of which part they are touching. Maybe it's the buttocks, maybe it's the breast, maybe it's the clitoris, whatever they're touching. And then sometimes it could just be the voice of that woman that you're thinking about. So those sensations can stimulate a man. Apart from the sensations, also this is what you call psychic stimulation, something in the mind. This could be thoughts. The man is thinking about how your last experience with him was or how if he gets you a woman, then how wonderful it can be. Those are thoughts which can make a man be stimulated. And that's why sometimes a man can erect even to a TV presenter because he's trying to imagine or when they watch porn, then they try to look at that in their mind and it stimulates as well. Or in the dreams, and this explains why men may have wet dreams, especially during the adolescent period when there is sexual maturation. So whatever the stimulation, whether sensations or psychic, what usually happen is that uh, information is sent to the limbic system in the brain. And limbic system responds by activating the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. Once the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system has been activated in this context of sexual stimulation, the next phase takes place. And what is it? That next phase is the erection phase. A man responds by erecting. Erection is what we are calling penile tumescence. So what happens? What does the parasympathetic system actually do so that erection takes place? In our earlier talk of the autonomic nervous system, we said that sympathetic is vasoconstrictive and we said that parasympathetic does not really act on blood vessels except the blood vessels of the penile vasculature. So the blood vessel in the penis respond to parasympathetic stimulation by undergoing vasodilation. This vasodilative response is not because of the normal acetylcholine we know, but largely because of nitric oxide mechanisms. And that's why the drugs which are also used in maintaining penile erection could be basically drugs which ensure that we have enough nitric oxide in the penile bed. It explains to you why sometimes even a man can erect when they're under general anesthesia because we use nitric oxide. So vasodilation does what? Vasodilation causes blood to flow more into the penis. So there's more blood flow into the erectile tissues, corpus cavernosum and corpus spongiosum expand. When the cavernosal and the spongy tissue expand, they'll expand towards the tunical buginia. That has an effect on the subtunical veins that I told you earlier. When the erectile tissues expand towards the tunical buginia, they do compress the subtunical veins. 
now see this. So here we have veins beneath the tunical bugina, the yellow thing. And this is the erectile tissue. Let's assume this is corpus cavernosum. In the flaccid state, the corpus cavernosum is not really um, distended or expanded. And so there's no pressure on the subtunical veins. But in a state where the blood vessels, there is increased blood flow into the penal erectile tissue, so they fill the spaces filled with blood. That makes the erectile tissue to expand. The expansion of the erectile tissue compress the subtunical veins. The compression of the subtunical veins prevents venous drainage from the penis because the subtunical veins take blood from the erectile tissues outside from the penis. So if they are compressed, it means that blood cannot come out from the penis easily. So that brings me to why does erection really occur? Erection occurs because two things have happened. One, the vasodilation has caused increased blood flow into the penile erectile tissues. So there is some level of expansion because of vasodilation. But this is coupled with something else very critical that when occlusion has occurred because of that expansion and because of an occlusion we don't have venous drainage away from the penis. We've reduced venous outflow from the penis. So you are increasing arterial blood inflow and you are reducing venous blood outflow from the penis. Those two work together to cause an erection. You might be surprised that one cannot work alone to cause erection or at least sufficient or significant erection. I think I'm looking for the term efficient erection. So if one only is acting, you will not have efficient erection. You need that increased blood flow, need to be coupled with reduced venous outflow from the penis. So this story of penile, or rather sexual stimulation, penile tumescence, that occurs very frequently, perhaps on a daily basis in any man. It can happen even several times in a day. It can even happen when someone is attending an online class and is alone or with other women around. It can happen when someone is in town walking. It can happen anytime, easily happens. So our story usually ends there most of the time and goes back and uh, we are used to it as men. But if this is in the context of sexual act or some form of it, maybe real time sex or maybe masturbation or whatever, the man is still entertaining the thought, then penal tumescence will be sustained and can even graduate to the third level. The third phase is what we are calling urethral lubrication. This is still under the influence of the parasympathetic division of the nervous system that was activated. But as the stimulus continues, you know that sexual stimulation that was there is still there, either from thoughts or from the sensations, but that's still there. So if that continues, then we'll have to have a phase of urethral lubrication where the corpus glands secrete some fluid. Now the corpus glands respond by secreting fluids which lubricate the urethra and that's why we are calling it urethral lubrication. Of important to note is that uh, the lubrication of the urethra is not adequate for coitus. The lubrication that is adequate for coitus must come not from the urethra but from the female. So the lubrication that is adequate for coitus usually 
is from the female, not from male. But yes, you've noted that during sexual response, male will also lubricate the urethra. If the stimulus is still going on, which means maybe it's in the context of sex or masturbation or whatever else is happening, then this can graduate to male orgasm. Male orgasm is basically the climax of sexual response. And it occurs during intense sexual stimulation, usually associated with pleasurable physical sensation, followed by a general release of tension. The person now just feels relaxed. What happens? <clears throat> if we have intense sexual stimulation, it will activate the sympathetic nervous system. Remember, sympathetic nervous system was not into play until this time. When the sympathetic nervous system is activated, two things happen, which constitute male orgasm. One is what we call emission phase of male orgasm. Emission phase of male orgasm involved the feeling of the internal urethra. The internal urethra is the posterior urethra or what we've called a few minutes ago, the prostatic urethra. The prostatic urethra fills with secretions which come from the prostate itself, seminal vesicles and the vast difference. Usually the prostate has its ducts that open directly into the prostatic urethra. Seminal vesicles, we saw that the duct of seminal vesicles join with the duct with the vast difference to form the ejaculatory duct, which also open into the prostatic urethra. So the secretions from those sites basically fill the prostatic urethra under this sympathetic stimulation. And for that to happen, usually during emission phase, there are some contractions of the male internal genitalia. So the prostate contract, the vast difference contract, the seminal vesicles contract, they have smooth muscles within their walls actually that facilitate that contraction. So that the semen is deposited within the prostatic urethra. That's what you call emission phase. Once emission has occurred, ejaculation is almost inevitable. What is ejaculation? Ejaculation is a reflex ex expulsion of semen from the prostatic urethra to the exterior, wherever exterior is, to the exterior under pressure. Now, that pressure is usually caused by rhythmic contractions of the internal genitalia and pelvic floor of the male. So what I'm saying is that as long as there are some secretions within the prostatic urethra, this is almost a spinal reflex. It is almost inevitable, out of control, as long as the internal urethra has filled. Ejaculation becomes a reflex. That's why you hear of stories of, oh, I was not able to control and things like that, partially true because it's a reflex. Partially may not be true because there's an initial phase there that can be controlled. All right, so after a man has ejaculated, what happens? Uh, you most likely know what happens, that uh, men go to a stage of sexual resolution. This occurs immediately after orgasm and it involves two things. Sexual resolution in male involve detumescence, which simply means the end of erection. So erection ends because during orgasm, the sympathetic nervous system is the one that was activated. Now we know the other effect of sympathetic nervous system on blood vessels, that it causes vasoconstriction. So because of that vasoconstriction, there'll be reduced blood flow to the penis. And so that means that uh, less blood flow to the penis, that means less venoclusion as well. So 
those two reasons we had for erection now are nullified. And that's why the two missions take place. And you ask yourself, why should this happen even against the wish of the man, against the woman? And the simple answer is this. Irrespective of how interesting the sex was and things like that, remember at some point the penis was not receiving oxygen adequately because there's no blood flowing out of the penis. So it reaches a point the oxygen circulation is very low. You surely don't want that to happen for a long time. And we usually say you would rather uh, end the erection and leave, let the penis live to have another experience another time than have full erection forever and that's the end of it for the rest of its life. So basically, the erection must end so that we have fresh flow of oxygen through the penis. Apart from the tumescence, there's another thing that happens. Men go into a refractory phase. The refractory phase is a period of diminished sexual excitement. This man who was very energetic on you Perhaps you are out and you went into a room and could hardly even allow you to close the door. Started undressing you in the corridor as you're going towards the, you didn't even reach the sitting room. This man who was very aggressive and it's now no longer interested at all. You are there naked and it's like they're even blind. Usually there's a period of diminished sexual excitement. And during that period, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it is harder compared to the previous, harder to achieve another erection and even orgasm for a variable period of time. Again, remember, it's a variable period of time. It could be seconds, minutes, hours, days, I hope not weeks and months. But after a man has ejaculated and felt satisfied, the sexual excitement goes down almost to zero, diminished completely. And uh, during that period, he doesn't even feel like another one for a variable period of time. That is what you call the refractory phase. Again, it's something that happens. So ladies, uh, if you see it happening, don't say these guys are animals. It's just normal physiology in male. Right, so those are the stages of male sexual response. Let's finish with the, this slide, the ejaculate, before I give a break. So the ejaculate is what comes out, what the men ejaculate, basically the semen. Usually it's about 4.5 ml. But of course this volume varies depending on many things. In a normal state, let's say nobody's, someone is not sick. It varies depending on whether, how often do you actually do this? If it's someone who has been having it almost every day, you know, the volume will be different for someone who has stayed for one year without having sex. Or maybe, let me not say having sex, someone who has not ejaculated for several days or months will produce a bigger volume compared to someone who has been doing it almost every day. So, but a normal um, volume is that. This is particularly important if you're going to evaluate people with infertility and perhaps a man is being sent for semen analysis. Uh, you we usually recommend telling them to abstain for at least three days. Okay, usually it should be two to three days, but you know, the definition of two days and three days might be very worry, uh, weird, especially in the context that you are depriving someone sex, they might decide to interpret it differently by starting from perhaps uh, Wednesday night at uh, 11 p.m. Then they say it was from Wednesday and then stop at, uh, let's say, uh, Friday very early in the morning at 1 a.m. And then they say those are three days yet they're not. So usually we tell them at least three days so that even if it is two days, it's fine. 
Um, in terms of the amount of sperms which are within the ejaculate, usually one ml of sperms would have about 100 million sperms. And so the normal sperm count in an ejaculate will be about 300 to 500 million sperms in an ejaculate. In terms of color, uh, the semen is usually whitish, opalescent, very thick, mucoid. But again, if it's been frequent, then it should be less, more watery and less thick. I'm not saying now you go evaluate how uh, the person you're sleeping with, with the color, then you tell whether now they're cheating on you or not. There are many parameters involved. Um, the color is slightly opalescent. You can't see through it at the beginning. But if you allow semen to settle for about 30 minutes, then it will, it will undergo liquefaction. And so you may see through it, it becomes more transparent. The pH of semen is slightly alkaline. And this alkaline uh, secretion is largely contributed by the prostate gland. And the primary role is to basically neutralize the acidic environment of the vagina. Because sperms may not survive in that acidic environment for long. And that's why sperms would only survive for about two to three days in the female tract in as much as they survived for two to three months in the male tract. The ejaculate come from where? Seminal vesicles produce the largest volume of semen followed by the prostate gland. Then about 5% or less is contributed by others. So these others would involve the vast difference itself and that's the one that contains the sperms. Very little actually in terms of volume. Um, apart from vast difference, then you can also talk about the corpus glands and the liters glands. They contribute 5% or less. Right, so that is the story of the male reproductive system. I will allow you to ask questions if you do have before I give you a short break. <laughs> 